excellent. How are you? Doing very well, thanks. Doing very well. Are, are you out in Philadelphia or? Yes, California? I am. Okay. Okay. Can you see me all right? Can you hear me all right? We good? Yes, yes, definitely can do so. Yes. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Well, I'm not well, sure if you've seen any of our shows or stuff. Uh, I have. As a matter of fact, I watched the whole uh, As Yet miniseries. Okay. <laughs> okay. And there were definitely a few discrepancies I would love to shed light on. Uh, okay. You know, at least talk from my, my side of the story for what it's worth. But uh, just let me know when we're rolling and I'll, I'll answer whatever you, you know, want to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, with, with, with our shows, generally, um, we, we tend to go through the journey, you know, how you got into I love music. it. And then, so we kind of build into that. And I know you've done other works outside of, you know, your, your work sure. with my, um, my Angelo and stuff. So we, at least we go through through that journey and stuff. But we, we have an international audience, so it's always good to start from the beginning as to where you were sort of from and, and, and um, how you got into music. Awesome. So, uh, well... I'm from Philadelphia, born and raised. Uh, my parents are from Puerto Rico. I'm the first generation born uh, in the US mainland. Um, and I grew up in a pretty rough inner city neighborhood. Um, Frankfurt, uh, sort of like North Philly. If you've ever been to Philly, you would know it's one of the rougher neighborhoods. Uh, even now it's ranked one of the top 10 worst neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Wow. Um, and I was kind of like, a quiet kid, a really nerdy kid. I was a straight A student. My mother um, is, was and still is blind. And my father was a career criminal, what's known as a lifetime offender. Um, wow. Yeah, he's been, what God rest his soul. He was in and out of jail for multiple crimes, most of which he was guilty for. Uh, and, you know, it was pretty rough upbringing. My mother had the presence of mind to send us to Catholic school because it was the closest thing we can get to a private education outside of the uh, you know, crumbling public school system. And I was a straight A student, never absent, never late. Not because I was so smart, but because I couldn't see either. Like I had to have surgeries on my eyes later in life. So I listened very well and I did all my homework in school so I wouldn't have to carry books home because I needed to run as fast as I could. Wow. <laughs> you know, like, um, and going to, uh, growing up in Philadelphia, you have a mixture of all the cultures clashing like you know i lived in a black neighborhood um my family's puerto rican which also is mixed with black but you know that's a whole other thing there's culturally latino and then there's uh the mixtures of well i went to a school for high school central high school which was uh one of the top it still is one of the top cities schools it's a magnet school for college preparatory uh and they you see a lot of uh asians and whites and blacks uh latinos all sorts of different cultures and religions all mixed together okay. so um, that was kind of a snapshot of what uh, got me into music. I was actually kind of, I'll say late in the sense that I always kind of had an ear for music, but as far as wanting to do it as a career, it really didn't kick in until about the 10th grade. Um, I, I see all of my stories uh, eventually <laughs> end up with a girl involved. Um, I had a crush on a girl that I wanted to get next to and she was in the gospel choir. So when I heard the gospel choir of Central High School's gospel choir singing, the music was so compelling that, you know, I thought, oh, this will be cool. Like, I, I was always afraid to, to read in front of the class and be in front of people because I was so shy and introverted that I thought, hmm, I can kill three birds at one stone. Like, I can get over my fear of being in front of people. Um, I can be around this great music and I can kind of hide in the choir, kind of get next to this girl. Yeah. Um, and wouldn't you know, after a couple of weeks of hiding, uh, somehow I got a lead vocal and I don't know why, but they offered me a lead vocal. And ironically, the song was called Open Our Eyes, which is funny, seems how I had all these eye problems. Um, then uh, I entered into this uh, competition. We had like a mini Apollo in our school. Okay. And I, one of the girls in gospel choir, I did a duet with Always by Atlantic Star. We went on fourth out of about 20 acts. And the next day they announced the winner and we had won. Wow. So then the girl that I really liked, uh, she, uh, I asked her to the, to the prom and everything. And it was, I was an instant celebrity. I was, oh boy, <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> did she say yes? Uh, she did, but I, I hope she's not watching. But in, in retrospect, I, I think I, I, I should have chosen someone who would have appreciated the opportunity <laughs> as opposed to someone who uh, put me on her itinerary. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> you know, like, when, I went to, when I went to go uh, to this prom, 
uh, I, I show up at her place, you know, like I'd spent all of my summer saving up uh, because I asked early, like I won the competition in the winter time. And I thought, oh, this is going to be time to get a job and like work <laughs> after school and save up enough money for the limo and all, you know, and get a tux and the whole thing, right? Oh, my goodness. And when I show up and her, her mom opens the door, she's like, oh, just wait down here, right? And I walk into like this little like uh, office area and I see like the wall of shame where like this same girl with like 20 different other guys with the corsage posing and like she goes on everyone's, she's been going on everyone's prom since like the ninth grade because she's oh that hot. Goodness. <laughs> yeah. So needless to say, um, she, I, you know, I'm sure she thought I was a nice guy and I were, probably was a little square, you know, green. <laughs> but that being said, uh, I think she kind of took advantage of the idea of going to my prom so she can hang out with her friends because I only saw her when we got there after we took the pictures and when we ate and then we had one dance together and it was the electric slide. That's not exactly, you know, <laughs> romantic. Uh, and yeah, I got a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, a well, lot of times it, I take it. Well, it can always be an inspiration for songwriting, but I mean, from high school though, um, and, and, and I, was, I was curious, you, you mentioned were you, I mean, were your eyesight, how did that affect you in school? Well, okay. Uh, thing was, like, my mother's blind and, like, the rest, I have two brothers and two sisters, and all of us had different degrees of blindness. Um, actually, a couple of my sisters, you know, they only wear glasses for reading. But for me personally, I didn't realize how much worse my vision was than other people, because I can only see about six inches in front of my face before I had to, like, uh, it was just kind of blur out. So I would read the books with my nose and use it as the guide to read. Um, I took the bus and the trains and stuff to school, but you can tell, you know, which bus it was by basically how many, you see like a grouping of lights and then space and then a grouping of lights. And I'm like, okay, if I'm catching the K bus, it's only one light and then a space. If it's the 89, it's two lights and then a space, you wow. know? And then as far as um, musically, I didn't realize there was a such thing as perfect pitch I just always knew what key a song was in. Not like, you know, oh, that's B flat sharp or whatever. I just knew that if you were not starting the song in the wrong key or if it was sped up, like yeah. on the radio or whatever, I would know that it wasn't in the original key. And when I got into gospel choir, I would make up notes that weren't there. Like I would always hear like these little color notes and seconds and sevenths and, you know, like just I'd hear a note that would fill out the harmony. And it used to get on uh, the choir director's nerves at first, but I'll give it to her, Miss Wilma Safford. She actually at one point said, look, I can't stop you. You know what? Let me get, uh, there's a couple other people in this choir that have a good ear. And she made a fourth section to, in, you know, in the choir. Because at the time we only had like, you know, the tenor, uh, alto and soprano. And then she would split it sometimes to first and second soprano. And then, you know, after the year, after I joined, uh, there started to be like a baritone group because I wasn't a tenor, still not a tenor. Yeah. Uh, I had a really high falsetto and then like a low speaking voice and nothing in between. And I had to really work at blending that head voice and uh, working through singing with your neck and getting through all of those kind of tensions. So I think the visual thing, it helped me to hear spatially. Like when I hear a song, even to this day, when I hear music, if I'm listening, if you ask me to listen to a song, I yeah. will put on the headphones and shut everything else out. I can listen to each individual part, as, especially when it's like live too as well. Like I try to imagine, um, I can see the bass player playing his parts and his fingering and articulation. I can hear um, each note. I can hear the chords in the structure that they're put into. And also I can hear EQs, dynamics, effects. I can hear the echo of when they're recording it in the bathroom. I can hear the emotional context of when somebody is feeling something. Um, I can, most of the time, I mean, sometimes, you know, looks yeah. or say sounds can be deceiving, but you know, I can usually tell you um, a lot about the person's background um, just by their choices musically. Wow. So when you, you start off describing, um, you know, the challenges with you, your, your dad and then your mom and then the neighborhood you, you grew up in, but also the fact that you went into a school that um, had a very different outlook um, academically. Did you have a, an idea of what career or where you wanted to be or what you could be with your background? You know what the the crazy part was in from first eight from first to eighth grade I went to Catholic school and all I thought was in my mind I was I had tunnel vision I thought the only way I'm going to get out of this situation is to get really good grades and that's why I was never absent never late and plus I didn't want to be home 
you know, with an abusive, any, anything, any excuse for me not to get my ass beat, you know? So I'm like, for instance, if I got a 99 on a test, a 99 out of a hundred, you know, my dad would say, what'd you get wrong? Not congratulations, not, oh, that's great. The first thing, what'd you get wrong? And if you get this complex about being like, a, you know, anything less than perfection is failure. And that really hurt me uh, emotionally for years. Like good enough was never good enough. Um, but as far as my future potential, when I got into high school, um, they do like these, you know, you're allowed to choose like the music track or the art track you know, sciences or, uh, you know, like physical, let's say you, you wanted to do um, sculpting or drafting or like, I was never into any, any. I wasn't even into music like that. I thought, you know what, um, I'm gonna take visual art because it would be the most challenging because of my visual impairment. I thought, you know what, let me just do something completely out of my wheelhouse. And I've always kind of been like that. Then I was in the delayed entry program in the military as well, um, before they found out my vision was screwed up. Uh, they'll let you sign up when you're 17. And I, I signed up for carpentry masonry, even though I tested uh, to be an officer. They said, oh, you could be an officer and sit behind a desk. Um, a lot of people, um, I was also given, I say a lot of advice, uh, which I didn't take. For instance, uh, my school counselors in high school, they said, oh, you could be a, a lawyer. Um, based on like the, the things that I was good at, language, uh, I was really great with English and math. When I did that, uh, I don't know if in England they have something different, but we have like the SATs. Okay. And it's kind of like, usually the men score higher uh, in the math and the, w the girls, women score higher in verbal, but I had like almost yeah, identical scores on both. Okay. So the last thing that I thought I was going to do before music, the music bug bit me, I thought I was going to be some kind of a computer engineer, you know, like, because I, I was kind of into, into computers, this is many years ago, but like, you know, I learned how to like, plot and program, make a little video game uh, using an old school floppy disk PC. And I like taking things apart. I was really technically oriented. But then um, my guidance counselors, when I was looking uh, for scholarships, at, you know, at, when I was graduating, they said, okay, I had gotten Ivy League scholarships for um, business at Wharton Business School, which interestingly enough is where uh, Donald Trump went. Um, and University of Penn, um, I did, take some business administration courses, and then I eventually wound up uh, accepting a scholarship to University of the Arts for Jazz Voice. But that was a couple of years after I had taken a hiatus and I was singing in the singing group. And my family thought I was crazy because they're like, you turned down Ivy League scholarships to sing with a street corner group? Are you nuts? But, uh, but, but why did you, uh, what, what, what brought about this the decision to not pursue a career in, in education? But um... Um, at the time, right? At the time, my heart was really into the music. And before, before I got into the, the group that was, would be known as As Yet, we were called As Yet Untitled, it was something that I would do after school. And I still had like my day job, you know, and I was still pursuing my career. But, you know, I agreed to give it some time because when you're young, you know, you have time. And you think, okay, well, let's just try it. And we were winning a lot of competitions together. Um, we were like getting a lot of uh, local press and sponsorships and things, even as amateurs. This so was, I saw this. Yeah, this was event. a different group. No, this was okay. This group uh, had in it at the time some of the members who are now in the current as yet, uh, the current as yet, the one you interviewed. So Claude Thomas, Deanna Allen, Kenny Terry, okay. and Sean Rivera, and Damon Core, who used to be a no question, who passed away. God rest his soul. Uh, Dashan Benson was in it as well after Damon Core. So in the current as yet, you have Dion, Kenny, and Dashan. Well, Dashan left and now it's Claude. So three out of those guys were in the group that I was in back in from say 90, 89, 90. Um, and then I'd gotten a lot of scholarships and offers. And after a while, I got tired of turning them down because I just felt like, you know what? We're spinning our wheels here and as great as we sound and as much as my gut is telling me that we're good enough, uh, and there was like a magic when we sang together. There's just, you know, talent is never enough. There's always a business aspect or a personal thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the resentment was growing. Uh, we're, I didn't ha they didn't have a fallback plan or anything else going on other than music. So whenever something would happen for me, it seemed as though certain folks would uh, take it as a threat to the group. Like I got offered a scholarship uh, in Belgium overseas 
uh, they did like an exchange student thing. And, you know, uh, one of the guys was like, well, that's, you're going to be gone for a year. You know, are you sure you need to think about it? And, you know, tears and everything. So. But at, 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 at that time, because um, when you have um, the offers to, 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 to sing and stuff like this, and you have the offers for school, it, you, was your dad still in a picture for him to, because I would have thought he would have been very much over what, you know, get into the university or. My, my mother was actually the educator. She has a, a degree from Temple, um, uh, as master's in education. She's also, um, you know, into everything from holistic medicine, nutrition, education. She taught at uh, Head Set and Get Start for the uh, visually impaired. Um, so she was the one who really pushed for education. But one thing I will say for my mother was that she was always about following your heart, about going with your gut and, you know, Sometimes our emotions can lead us astray, but there came a point when we, meaning as yet untitled, got offered a record deal with LaFace, and I was still at University of the Arts. And I spoke to the late, great Sean Dibler, who's my favorite music professor of all time. And he said to me, people, go to school so that they can get an education so they can earn a great job. This opportunity you have on the table may never come again, but you can always take a leave of absence. If you're not happy, come on back. So kudos to him for that offer. Uh, and I went out to California. I was the youngest in the group at the time by about four years. So, you know, I thought, oh, what, what do I have to lose? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think if we, if we look at um, as yet, how did you guys, so from your point of view, how did you guys all meet? Yeah, how did you okay. meet them and, 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 and things come it, together? It takes at least two people to start a group unless one person puts out an ad and says, I'm trying to build a group, whatever, a Sean and the Seanettes, who, you know, I'm not, yeah. I wasn't taking auditions for the Seanettes. So I, I used to live on Frankfurt Avenue, uh, which is a uh, so, what do you call it? It's like a, com it's a commercial area and an elevated train runs past the window and I lived on top of the storefront. So can you imagine every day hearing doo -doo 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 train going past your window, the station is at the corner, uh, there's buses running down and there's stores and everything. And every day on my way to school, I would get on the train platform and I would hear this guy singing from down below in front of the storefronts. And one day, you know, when you're young and you're just cocky and I'm like, what? This guy, in my mind, I mean, I honestly thought, this guy does not sound that good, but he's so confident. Why is he, like, I didn't have that kind of confidence, but somewhere in my heart, I was like, I could really sing better than this guy. And if he's got this kind of confidence, you know what, I'm just going to go battle him. Don't ask me why. I swear <laughs> I'm not like that, right? So I went up to him and I was like, oh, you think you can sing? And he was like, oh, you think you can sing, right? And we started singing back and forth and a crowd of girls started standing. And that's why he, he loved to sing because of, this is Dion. Dion loved to sing because he loved the attention and the girls and stuff. And, you know, <laughs> okay. and... For me, it was like, wow, I'm getting out of my shell and I'm singing, this guy's like right here. We, we both kind of like became frenemies, you know what I'm saying? It was like, all right, all right. You, and he was like, I didn't know Julio's could sing, right? And I was like, well, you know, I didn't know uh, girls really like singing as much as uh, they love your singing, man, shoot, uh, I can only imagine, <laughs> right? So we start talking and like, I was still in gospel choir, right? But then at that time, um, Dion was in another group called Devious and Dangerous, and he was a DJ in this group called Devious and Dangerous. And I had gotten recruited when I sang that lead vocal, uh, Open Our Eyes, in Central Gospel Choir. There was a gentleman named Ali Hyman, who uh, was a Temple student at the time. Uh, and Temple was right, I'm sorry, um, LaSalle. LaSalle University is right next door. Uh, their campus is right next door to my high school. So he came over looking for members for his group and he recruited me into his group and his group at the time had Claude in it. The group was called Dimension in Sound and Dimension in Sound had Claude Thomas in it. Um, and pretty sure it was one of Al's cousins. Uh, this is so long ago, but to make a long story short, me and Dion got together and said, if we can get the best singers, like lead singers from other groups, you know, we want to put together a squad that has like every member you know, can hold their own. And we like started this thing where he wanted to leave his group and I wanted to leave my group, but I took Claude. Uh, well, I didn't take Claude. The way we framed the, the situation was, we're not, uh, what do you call it? We're not leaving your group 
you get to keep the name. We're not taking the group is not leaving you. You know what I'm saying? You can keep the name dimension and sound and, and put your own members in. And me and Claude are going our own way, but we wish you the best. And we've been, me and Al have been friends ever since. He came to my wedding. Uh, we, we competed against each other in different groups. And then, so then it became me, Dion, and Claude. And then Damon, I met Damon Core, who was in No Question, which was signed to Philadelphia International. I met him way before then because his cousin sang in gospel choir. And his cousin said to me, oh, you think you can sing? Uh, where do you meet my cousin? And this guy, I'm sorry, the guy's name is uh, Sean. I want to say Sean Hankins. Another Sean. So his cousin was the one who sang the duet with me uh, in the gospel choir, the girl, uh, Kadata Stringfield. Is Kadata Stribbling? Kadata Stribbling. Oh man, she was awesome. Um, so we sang together. Uh, her cousin brought this guy, Damon. And when I heard Damon, I was like, you know what? He can sing better than me. Let's put him in the group. I mean, straight up, he, he was, he sounded like Donny Hathaway or somebody like, you know, somebody just has a natural tone. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he didn't have to try. It just, you close your eyes and you heard magic, you know? Um, so then it was us four. And then we went to this place called the Wyndham Franklin Plaza Hotel. Uh, I'm skipping a few years ahead because we'd performed a lot of talent shows as four members for a while. Yeah. And then we would, you know, people came and went, but that four stayed together. But then Kenny Terry was in the bathroom at the Wyndham Franklin Plaza. He'd worked there and he was cleaning the bathroom. And we were at the hotel because they were doing like this uh, music conference and we were singing and trying to get ourselves noticed. And as we're in the bathroom, which is like the great place to rehearse and record, I mean, record, perform for the acoustics, right? We got to hear the yeah. echo. All of a sudden we, we hear this big booming voice coming out, uh, singing Patti LaBelle, right? But I mean, with a super high pitched voice yelling in the men's bathroom, right? And we look down and we see like legs sticking out of the stall because he's <laughs> six foot four. And this big dude comes out like, we're like, is that you? He's like, yeah. <laughs> we're like, what the? This guy has mad range. So we're like, wait, you got a really low voice. Can you sing bass? And we just like tried him out right then. And we sounded so good in that bathroom that we, from that day, that he said, when I get off work, right, he, he went to go change his clothes and we got back together and performed as five people at that hotel that he worked at. Wow. And we sang for like, I'll be sure, uh, Father MC, like all these artists at the time who were, um, had their own labels, uh, Andre Harrell, um, I mean, you name it. So it was one of those things where so many good things kept happening for the group because of our dedication, our work ethic, like Dion used to make the clothes. Claude and I were both arrangers, but Claude was a little bit older than me. So he had more experience like recording himself. Like he had a little keyboard and he recorded like a four track uh, cassette recorder. No, actually a double cassette where he bounced one to the other and he kept overlapping. So like, you know, we would bounce ideas off each other and it was, it was a great thing. So once we got that whole, that unit, that five, that nucleus together, it, it, we spent about six years performing, competing from 89 to 95, roughly. Um, there was some version of me, Claude, Dion, Kenny, and Damon was in for about four of those years. Dashan was in for about three of those years. You know, like the, they were, for whatever reason, there's always that one rotating slot. Um, it's just like any other group, like how, you know, a new edition had like Bobby Brown, but then they had Ralph Tresvant. Like you have that competing tenor sort of thing going on with a lot of groups. Um, for whatever reason, um, I really believed that we were going to make it, even though all your friends tell you, oh, if you're going to make it, you'd have made it by now. Like, you stupid. You should have been done this and been done that. But when you guys, uh, so within those six years, what are you doing? Are you in, are you in school? Are you getting a job? What's, what, what happened? Well, I can't speak for everybody else. Um, yeah, no, but for although, you. But yeah, although for I would you. love to. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was still in school. I had jobs after school. Like I used to work in restaurants. I worked in nightclubs, um, a lot of people places. And then even to the point where like, I worked at a nightclub once downtown for a while called the Cat Club. And the mm -hmm. Cat Club had a room in the back, like um, VIP lounge. And I got our group booked in the place. So I would work as a bar back and then go change my clothes, then hop on stage and sing with them, and then put my uniform back on and close the night out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, like I, I would always, like I was in school, I was taking classes at University of Arts um, and like the jazz voice, but it's not, how can I explain this? It's not a school like, um, 
most art schools, it's a university. So you still have to take like languages and, you know, math, arts and sciences, you have to pre-qualify because it's an accredited university. It's not like, oh, I'm just taking like some classes on the side. So it's yeah. really intense. Um, and the only reason that I didn't graduate was because I took that record deal uh, in California. But for that time that we were together, we, we did like the Chorus Light um, talent competition they had and they had um, like, Show, we did shows in Jersey and DC, New York. We went up to the Apollo, um, the, the real Apollo as amateurs and then again as professionals. Um, we rehearsed a lot. Like we would sit together in, in a circle and stare up at the ceiling uh, and sing. And then my aunt would cook rice and beans. Uh, and you know, like she knew us like family, so she didn't mind and let us, she just loved to hear the sound of us all singing together. Uh, and then on the side, you know, everybody did whatever they did. But in, 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 in your mind back in, in, in those, um, early 90s or so when the emergence of uh, groups um you know on the radio and stuff and i'm sure boys to men from philly did you then think if they can make it we can make it what was in your mind you know what uh, honestly when boys to men we we knew boys to men because we had appeared um we appeared at locations they were at so we'd seen them perform we'd heard about them they were from philly before they got the record deal and, you know, they were good. They were always good. Um, most of the groups in Philly, which there were a lot of groups, like uh, Image, Quarter to Midnight, um, you know, As Yet, Untitled, you know, Boys to Men, uh, Voices of Theory. Um, there's a lot of groups I'm leaving out. But the thing was, um, many of them seemed to give up when Boys to Men got their deal because it seemed like the chances of getting another group from Philly so soon right after, it took, it took so many years for one group to, to come out of Philly. Like it had been a while since the Philly International heyday. Mm. So I think a lot of groups uh, got discouraged, but again, I'm not in those groups. It just seemed as though a lot of groups gave up, but to tell you the truth, we really did know that we were at least as good it wouldn't be a fair comparison because it's five on four, but we thought, you know, if they can get a deal, yes, we can get a deal. Absolutely. And, but we never compared ourselves to them. The industry did that. We wanted to go in a, a different direction. Like they were a little, they had a unique sound and they're cool. Like the Cooley High Harmony and all that. Was, are you kidding me? We used to sing their songs. We used to sing their songs all the time because why not? And we'd add a little fifth harmony to it. Great. We were all influenced by the same kind of musical uh, background. However, I think we wanted to go in a different direction creatively, but the label, thank goodness, um, for LaFace Records, believing in us, the marketing aspect was a lot easier to say, hey, look, um, we're looking for a group to be a competition for boys to men because they're hot right now. And that's what labels do. They say, who's hot right now? Let's find you know, the answer to that or the, yeah. the, the foil, the nemesis. So yeah. they pitted us against each other when we really were always friends. Okay. So, I mean, back in those days then, so here you are, um, when you guys are together, did you have roles within the group? Like for yourself, did you have a role um, that you, that was yours oh. it, within, within the group? You know, absolutely. Well, roles changed, or I'll say evolved. Like the hats that I've worn the most, I'll say. When we first got together as As Yet Untitled, Claude was the arranger who brought songs in. And then I became an arranger who added notes that were missing. And then as I got more experienced, I would bring in songs that I was working on. And, you know, it got really um, fun because everyone had great ideas. So then as far as the, the business side of things, I, I was actually the CFO slash uh, treasurer for the As Yet Inc. portion of things when we were a corporation. Um, I was usually the, the mouthpiece, the speaker for um, the liaison between the group and the management a lot of times because um, for whatever reason, whenever there was bad news, I'm the one that had to go and deliver it. <laughs> um, and then I think, uh, you know, when the group got signed, 
in addition to being, well, club wasn't in the group anymore. So then I became the only arranger, which okay. brings me to a point that I wanted to clear up for the listeners, for the five people who care. I watched the interview with As Yet, and um, I would like to, for the record, state that Sean Rivera, I alone arranged and produced the acapella version of Hard to Say I'm Sorry for the As Yet record. Anyone who has the physical CD can read where it says, produced by Babyface and David Foster. And then you look, you scroll down and it says, co-produced by Sean Rivera, arranged by Sean Rivera. They were not there. I did it on a, a port of studio. I overdubbed all the parts from top to bottom, brought to Babyface's house. And we have witnesses. Daryl Simmons was there. John B was there. They loved the arrangement. They said, you know what? We're gonna record this for the album. I taught it to the group and we came in and sang it live and recorded it within about a couple of hours. I don't know why they went online to say we did it when we wasn't there. And the sad part to me is that the group is so talented, they didn't need to take credit for my work. And there are interviews that they've done before where I, they used to give me credit where credit is due. Just like I sat here and told you how many things I learned from Claude Thomas about arranging, the least I expected was for them to say, thank you, Sean, for giving us this wonderful arrangement that you came up with from scratch and put your heart and soul into when no one asked you to and no one paid you to. But no, you know, I wish them the best. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, and, it, and, it's, and I think sometimes when um, I do, I've done interviews where members left the group or the group is talking, I don't see so that, you know, we, they don't, we don't go into the details as to who left or why they left. So they tend to, um, so this is just experience from other groups, they tend to, I don't know, for any reason, not bring in the names of people who have left. Now, I understand that. I understand yeah. that, right? From the standpoint of you not, okay. I choose not to mention people if it's going to put them in a negative light. Yeah. Because I don't want to hurt their livelihood or their families. Yeah. But I don't see what harm it causes the group to thank me, just like they would thank Brian McKnight for Arrow Through My Heart or David Foster for uh, Hard to Say I'm Sorry. I don't see why they can't just say, hey, Sean came up with a great idea and we wish him luck. We wish him the best, mm. just like I'm wishing them the best. At that part, I'll never understand. I don't take it personal. I I'm just, I was shocked. Yeah. I'm just, I was shocked when I saw that. Wow. I was just like, wow, they can't even, none of them, nobody in that room who said we was there. None of them. So there's not even a way to spin that to make it seem like, well, it was the royal we. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? I mean, so well, when, when, not your so, fault. <laughs> yeah, no. So when you guys get signed, um, and and you, um, and because one of the things that I was trying to get to was the fact that you get signed by the face, their headquarters in Atlanta. That's where everyone's at. Was it a vote? Let's go to stay in California, LA, with with Babyface. No. Um, we didn't have a say in that at all, um, in the sense that we got the record deal after singing in DC. We auditioned in Washington, DC for Babyface. Um, he was doing a show, uh, a fundraiser yeah. for Border Babies uh, in DC. It was, we, we got to open for uh, Elder Barge, After Seven, and Babyface. We performed in a private conference first, and he loved what he heard. And it was funny because one of the cool parts about this story is that um, Jacqueline McQuarren, who is uh, Babyface's mother-in-law, Tracy's mother, yeah. God rest her soul, she said, you know what, you guys, um, I'm going to take the risk and buy you guys some ma matching outfits because we were bummy, you know, we scrubs. We, we all crammed in a car and drove up there, just whatever. So we went and bought little ties and white shirts and whatever, looking all sharp, right? And we, we had cordless mics in our pockets so that when we went to audition and Faith says, you guys ready? We pulled them out of our pockets and we're like, yep. And he was like, you guys really are ready. <laughs> like we weren't playing. So when we got the record deal, oh shoot, my light went out. No, it's, it's too I'm, I'm still me. Yeah. All right. Hey, this is live TV, folks. That's okay. I'm, I'm getting my refund. I just bought this joint today, so I'm taking it back. I'm kidding. I'm sure it probably just overheated. So make a long story short. 
And I just wanted to make sure the light was on. No, no light, screw it. Um, make a long story short, we signed to LaFace in California. They flew us to California. The label said, come here to record the record with Babyface because LaFace was starting a division called LaFace West. Okay. So they didn't start a new label called LaFace West. It was just a division of LaFace. And yeah. that label was to be, um, you know, I'm looking back on it now, there may have been a bit of competition, you know, because everyone looked at L.A. Reid as the business person and Face as the music guy. Um, so I think in a way there might have been like a kind of a healthy competition to say, hey, look, you know, I can handle my business too. And his wife being a very keen, well, his ex-wife now, being a very keen businesswoman, um, she probably uh, had a little bit of influence in that regard, because she, as, as you can see, she started a film company and she had another, her own label called Yab Young, which had John V on the label. Yeah. And um, there was uh, Edmonds Tower, which was uh, the old Lul Silas building. Um, yeah, I, they, I, worked there, I worked there for years. That's so. right. Yeah. So yes, we, we didn't have a choice. It wasn't, it wasn't as though, we, yes, we, we did go to Atlanta and we visited, but we were always kind of like the outsiders in a sense. Like yeah. we hung out with Tony Braxton and TLC and, you know, I'm like smoked out with Big Gip and all them, and you know <laughs> hung out with with CeeLo and uh, you name it, and, and and some of the other groups that didn't get as much shine, like Society of Soul. Um, anyway, for whatever reason, we happened to be the first uh, flagship artist on that LaFace West division, and when you first get in, you don't want to make waves. The last thing we're going to do is say, "No, we're putting our foot down. We're going to go to Atlanta." I yeah. mean. Besides, coming from Philadelphia, uh, it's a lot better. The optics are better when you say, hey, we're moving to L.A., like, yeah. go chase our dreams. Yeah. And they say, we're moving to Atlanta. Now people go to Atlanta to chase their dream. But back then, yeah, back uh, then. Atlanta was just budding. So here you are. So you're, you're, you're with, with, ba with Face, and, and he's saying, I'm going to write and produce the, the album. Did you, guys did you guys have any opportunity apart from the song that you did to get involved or he just said, okay, I just need your vocals and then go. You know, this is, this is an interesting, um, that's a great question. The process was, was really kind of learn as you go. So face was very open to ideas. If you presented them, you had to ch kind of choose your spots. So what would happen? Like he, he'd record a demo which was basically like the skeleton version of the song. We would have keys and a one take of the lead and we'd take it home and listen to it and learn it and come back. But then when it came to like the way the vocals were laid down, like for instance, with last night, the, the, the original demo, when it, when it came to the verses, mm. he just said, all right, you try it. And then after two takes, he wouldn't even put you in the booth yet. Everyone would line up. And he would say, okay, like, let's say Mark was standing there and he'd say, okay, Mark, try this. Last night. Okay, Dion, you try this. Last night. Right? And go around. And then, all right, you try it again. All right, you. So he'd give you like maybe two, two tries. And after that, whoever he liked, he put in the booth. So then when it came, to, when it came to my part, right? Like I knew my part was coming up because he had given it to me. Right? And I had to use the bathroom. So he's like queuing up the part and I'm sitting on a toilet, <laughs> like waiting, waiting to record my part. And I'm kind of like messing around with a little thing. But the way that the demo went, right? It was, um, you know, I said, I drank your wine as you taste mine. I kissed your lips, you felt my body. Like it, his, his version went, I drank your wine and you taste mine. You know, I kissed your lips, you felt my body. So he, said, he said, into your soul, girl, I heard you moan. And I went into your soul. It was an accident. It was like the second tape. And I was like, I forgot the words. He's like, no, we're keeping that. And that was it. The rest is history. A lot of people's favorite part of the song was a happy accident where I screwed the words up. Oh, so he, he keeps, so when you record it, he doesn't say to re-record. He just says, no, we'll just leave one take. No, and that's he has an art of knowing when to keep something that feels right, even if it's technically wrong. And that's a lost art because now people sterilize things with, you know, melodyne, auto tune. Yeah. Yeah. But he knew how to keep and he had to keep the right blue notes. And the thing was, I thought that I could have done it better even after he liked it. But I think because Mark was going to come in and hit almost pretty much the same note, but in full voice, 
mine had to be like an eighth of a tone underneath so that when he came in dead on, it would sound higher. Mm. You know, it's not like how people tune guitar strings slightly in or out. Yeah. It's a lost art, man. He, he's a freaking genius. So to answer your question, right, other than Hard to Say I'm Sorry, um, Mark Nelson did uh, co-write some songs, but the way he did it, I mean, no offense to Mark Nelson because he did what he had to do and he knows how I feel about him. <laughs> However, the way I envisioned the, the group working on a record was, hey guys, I've got an idea for a song for the album. What do you think? Oh, we love it. And then you go to Babyface and say, hey man, the guys really love this song. What do you think? No, what happened was some dealings were done on the side and then we show up at the studio like, surprise, you're doing this song that you've never heard before and you don't really like. That happened a lot. Not, not personally, not personally with Mark Nelson, but in general, um, the only person who played our songs for us before we got to hear them was Babyface. So all of his songs we liked, all of them. And there's a lot of songs that he did that didn't make the record that were great, fantastic. He didn't give us no B slap, no B slap songs. All of his songs were great. But what I'm saying is that a lot of times um, when it came to the rest of the group producing, um, well, it's like this, uh, Jacqueline McCorn, God rest her soul, asked the group who we wanted to work with. And the only person, the first person, I'll say the first person on my list was Mervyn Warren from Take Six because we were influenced by Take Six and I thought the only person who would give us that kind of sound would be the guy who was the arranger for Take Six at that time. To her credit, we worked with Mervyn Warren. And when we got to a certain stage of the record, it got to the point where because of personality conflicts and complications and scheduling, there were times when Face would say, hey, look, um, I'm gonna need you to sit here and take the chair for a minute. I got other stuff to do. So I became the guy who would sit and produce Kenny Terry's vocals or you know, make sure the harmonies were stacked right in between times. And that was a great learning experience for me. Um, I never asked to be credited because I didn't want to drive a wedge in. I was all, it was already difficult enough without driving a wedge in the group, um, trying to fight for credit for every little thing. Because I was already thankful that I got a song on the record, which actually turned out to be our most successful single in the sense that it was nominated for a Grammy and all those other things that came along with it. Mark's songs, uh, he did Time to End the, what, Time to End the Story and um, Every Bit of My Heart. Now, personally, a lot of people love those songs, but did I think that they were as good as the Babyface songs or, mm, they're all right. They're all right. And a lot of people love them, but I would have rather had two more Babyface songs I would have taken Hard to Say I'm Sorry off the record and got an original song from David Foster. So I'm not even saying that I think I'm all that great. I just thought when I, got, when I joined the group and when I stayed in for the six years, I thought we were going to do what we did to get the deal, which was we sat together and wrote songs together. We rehearsed together. We arranged our own stuff together. Everyone wrote their own verses. Then it became, you know, okay. But by the way, Mark Nelson was brought in to replace someone after we got the record deal. So we got the record deal without Mark Nelson, but because his range sat really high within uh, you know, the tenor range where, where Babyface writes, and because of his uh, be, having been in Voice to Men, um, and his talent, of obviously his talent, he was pushed to the forefront. And if it was up to him at the time, it would have been Mark and the Marquettes. <laughs> but um, did you guys not have um could i watch the temptations i've seen all this did you guys not have a meeting and say guys come on what brought us here let us keep to that so did, did no we had fist fights because the label when we signed the record deal how about this when we got the contract it said that we designate babyface as the sole producer executive producer and at his discretion he can bring other people in or not so I mentioned all of this, the meeting was had before we signed the deal. I was gonna walk away again. And they said, you know what? Um, how do you know you're not a lawyer? I'm like, it's plain freaking English to me. <laughs> Mr. I turned down scholarships to be here is trying to tell you that this ain't right. It's a conflict of interest that we got the mother-in-law as the manager, number one. Number two is that we have no creative input or control. And I think 
to the label's credit, they could sense that I was really resentful of that, or at least adamant about wanting to participate. And I feel like I did get an opportunity to participate at a level that many people would never have gotten the chance to. And the industry respects hustle. So if you show up and you ask questions and you're there, you know, you may get an idea here or there. And it wasn't, I wasn't the kind of person who's like, oh, I got to get all my ideas on. I wanted the whole group to sit and collaborate. But again, that's not why they signed us. They didn't sign us like when they sign, when they sign rock bands, they'll put them in a garage and say, keep working on it until you get a record together. Or we're going to put the band with the producer. Or we're going to hire session musicians and get you to replay their parts. Okay. It depends on what kind of band you're in. Yeah. But the kind of band we were in was, you are a vehicle for the label uh, slash uh, spokesmodels <laughs> you know what I'm oh, okay. for, for the agenda, which is cool. Okay. And that's a, they tell you to take a hit first so you can make a hit later. That, that Everyone tells you that story. Yeah, Do the what they story. say, and then you'll make a way. But by then, by then, you've already established your career um, having done things a certain way. So when you take away Babyface, and you take away Mark Nelson, then the industry's taking a step back, like, hmm, there's some elements missing that made you successful. We're not sure about you anymore. Hmm. And so, and, and, and I guess, because when I've interviewed other people in mm -hmm. other groups, they, they look at the contracts, they look at the situation and think, okay, it's not great, but it's better than nothing. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an, if we hit it off good, we can renegotiate the second contract. That's the true that. The, yeah, the, true that. Now you bring up a, a, a great point. The second, there was no second contract for us because we had a seven album deal, but the I, label didn't last <laughs> for seven albums. So basically, without getting too far into the details of things, I'll just say that they paid us to leave. Um, in the sense that other artists were involved in lawsuits, as you. Everyone knows TLC and Tony Braxton at the time were, had their issues with the face. We chose not to go that route because we didn't want to waste time, money, and energy trying to sue uh, the most powerful people in the industry when we could be rebuilding and moving on. Because they, you know, they, you're not allowed to record with another label until you've resolved that contract, or you got to get bought out by another company. And at the time, we didn't have the same management, and we didn't have Mark Nelson. And it's not that we wanted Mark Nelson. He was voted out. And, you know, we wish him the best, but he knows what decisions were made and how it was really done. And as a corporation, we owned the rights to the trademark and the name, but everyone was, the industry was scrambling because in addition to the label um, no longer existing other than as an imprint, we also had to deal with the fact that R&B was shifting away from the boy band era as they call it in the UK. So it was really difficult. We got signed to DreamWorks afterward. Um, and the deal was in some ways better, um, but under, you know, false pretenses and a lot of other issues that came along with that second deal. And then they wound up, Universal wound up buying out their catalog. And then DreamWorks stuck to movies and got rid of their whole music division. We were all signed with uh, Flow Tree, uh, Nelly Black Furtado, and Papa Black Roach, and I know Black, Black Street. Street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. I think David Geffen probably wanted to use his experience as a as a former record label owner to to to, to start up um, DreamWorks. Yeah, the SKG. Yeah. But so the the question then becomes: Did it become once you get signed? Did it stop becoming fun, and it became a, the the worst? Oh yeah. Job? You know what? It's funny that you mentioned that. I remember the first time we heard our music on the radio, or at least that I can remember. We're, we used to have a big house out in Baldwin Hills and you know, up on Presidio Drive. Uh, and the song came last night came on the radio. And we all start screaming and jumping and we're all excited. <laughs> Fast forward to like, mm, I don't know, three weeks later, not even a month later. It got to the point where people were, were walking past our house and singing it because they knew we lived there. And then it got to the point where we couldn't go anywhere alone, period, because they followed you everywhere. They met you places. They knew where you were going to be before you were going to be there. You couldn't take a crap. You always had to be camera ready and have security. And 
it just became like, uh, I just want to go get a 7-Eleven hot dog or, you know, take a crap without somebody sliding a, a phone number underneath the, the stall. I mean, it got, seriously, it, it got to the point where when we were traveling and we were on the road that, you know, at first you're like, oh man, you know, beautiful women everywhere, you know, <laughs> uh, unlimited everything, uh, room service to food to whatever. Then it got to the point where I was so tired that I didn't even care. They're like, but look, they got an after party. I'm like, did we, did we, uh, wait, okay, we agreed to do the after party. If, if we're contractually obligated, great. But if, because a lot of people would do this, right? They take it, they take it upon themselves to say, we're doing your after party. But if the venue that you contracted to do the show did not include an after party and the, the radio station is not sponsoring it, it's just some guy who took your picture and stuck it on a flyer and says, you better show up because it's going to make you look bad. And they try to guilt trip you into an after party that's not even sanctioned. Wow. You know? So but yeah, it, it got to be not fun. Yeah. I mean, so, but even, even the touring parts, did you guys, how did you guys then manage the five of you, you know, you know, despite Ooh, all the... We had a great road manager, I'll have to say this. Uh, Theo, Theo Jackson. Shout out to Theo Jackson. Theo Jackson. Um, he made things fun. Uh, we used to call him Baby Buddha because he was like, well, just think Baby Buddha, right? Okay. But, you know, he's, long story short, he's in much better shape now. Thank you. Um, but we would go to, like, for instance, in the UK. Um, you remember Smash Hits? We did, like, the Smash Hits tour yeah, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Um, with those two guys with Ant and Deck. Yeah, yeah they're, they're still here now. They're still. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so we're here. Yeah. We did, we did the Smash Hits tour, and we did Top of the Pops. We did the Lottery Show. Um, okay. Yeah, I know I'm old. And then, um, like, so we would go to all these new places and meet wonderful people. That was fun. It was awesome. Like, we went to, like, 40 countries, and, like, you know, I always wanted to find new food or new people and get souvenirs and shot glasses or whatever little trinkets, and then we'd go out and shop and, and then offer us free stuff, and then, you know, get to the lobby of the hotel and there's like girls there who, I don't know who uh, we didn't invite them but they're there and you know it was just that was fun like every I mean I recommend <laughs> that all artists who are fortunate enough to get it out of their system wear condoms but then um it after a while it becomes so repetitive and in our case I don't think I, I love performing I never got tired of that but what I got um frustrated with oftentimes is you know this you can't meet someone who doesn't already have an expectation of you, an expectation, a vision, or some sort of... I, so how do you trust anyone? Everyone's being so nice to you only because of. And then the types of people that you attract to your situation tend to be, you know, drawn to the excess, to the celebrity, to, you know, the power or the clock that comes along with that. So... For me, it became kind of empty. I remember the, the low point for me, well, a low point for me was we were performing at a high school and they made us change the lyrics, thank goodness, uh, because it was, uh, uh, you know what? It, yes, 14 year old girls should not be singing I Was Inside of You. Yeah. <laughs> so we get done the show and we're thinking, oh, this is great. We get to the, like the, they had like the schoolyard and all the, these little schoolgirls are out there singing, I was inside of you. They changed the lyrics back. And I'm like, this is <laughs> not good. Like, you know, as a father of, of two girls, like, you know, looking back on it now, it's like, I hope they understand that, like, this, that was not my plan to be, you know. And it's not that I'm saying that Babyface did anything wrong, but certain things are not for kids, you know, like, and it's cute when they don't understand. But I think when I say it's a low point, I mean, I started to realize that, like, it's not all fun and games. You have to think about the implications and the repercussions of the things you do. And right after a say no to drugs rally, one of the guys in our group uh, got, I'll say, semi arrested because they found weed in his hotel room. Like on our way down the stairs from a say no to drugs rally, they're like, sir, we have to ask you to come with us. Oh, <laughs> it's <goodness>. like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of stuff is not fun. Did 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 it all come and happen too quickly, or, or for I mean, because you've been spending six years rehearsing. So it didn't happen quickly enough. 
<laughs> well, if you spend six years, you know, practicing and rehearsing and touring, and then when the deal comes, it just seems as if you didn't prep for life as a celebrity because you, I, it just seems almost. There's like, no way you can unless. Okay, check this out, right? This this ought to answer your question. Is it not a common occurrence that the children of celebrities and child celebrities wind up uh, less than whole mentally? Mm. Wouldn't you think that they have more preparation than anyone? And it doesn't help. There is no way. You, can't, you, should, you shouldn't prepare for it because it's an unreality. It's unhealthy if you believe the hype. If you base your self-worth on nowadays it's all about likes and you know follows and you know all that other stuff but it was the same kind of mentality that clout chasing thing once you get emotionally invested in what people think of you the trades the tabloids and all of those things it's really damaging because it took well at least for me it took a while to understand that hey you know what you're never going to please everyone mm. period and for whatever reason, um, you want to be loved. Everyone wants to be loved for who they are. But if you don't know who you are, if you confuse who you are with what you do, you will be lost the minute you do something different or the minute you can no longer do what you do or when what you've always done stops working, then who are you? Yeah. And so from, from, from your point of view then, in, in the midst of... How, how many years would you say that you, from the time you signed, um, you know, doing a tour and the first album, were there then, did you guys go back after the, the success of the first album to say, let's start working on the second? Or had LA, so, um, have they sold the face to Arista and uh, that well, merger? Okay, we, okay. Okay, we signed in 94. And the... Last night went number one in 96. Like we signed in late 94. So 95, we spent recording the album um, and into 96 because we had a lot, a lot of downtime waiting um, for Face was working on, well, he was working on Waiting to Exhale and Tony Braxton's <laughs> album and all sorts of wonderful projects. So in the meantime, we were recording with a lot of great producers and some of which, this, uh, man, when I tell you some great songs from like, let's say, Mike City, Brian Alexander Morgan did some great stuff. Uh, he's the one that wrote with SWV. Yeah, um, yeah I, I interviewed him last week. Very, really one of my. That's my dude. No, he's yeah. he's he's the truth. So we did all these great songs and worked with a lot of great producers, and it never came out. It didn't make the first record. So not because who, they weren't who, good, who but decision, again, whose decision was it to, to not put say Brian's song or, or Mike City's um, song? Babyface was the soul an exclusive executive producer and the sole lead producer. We were being billed for his production services and we were using his facilities, which were also um, property and parcel of Arista distributed by BMG. So he was paying himself to pay himself. And our, our commission, well, let's just say our royalties had to reimburse him first before we saw anything. And I'm sure there were some tax write-offs involved with the business of that. So, you know, that's the way the game's played. So to answer your question, between the first and second album, we had an unusual amount of downtime. We thought, hey, we had two, you know, like platinum singles, number one song, Grammy nomination. We thought we were set. But, but, um, the writing was on the wall for a while that we were gonna go, uh, we were gonna switch management because, well, we were advised and instructed by some power players that certain doors won't open unless we make a switch. Now, because of the potential legal implications, I cannot name who told us these things. However, I will say that when we, I was the guy who had to break the bad news to Jackie McQuarren, sat down and said, you know, we appreciate everything you did for us. You believed in us from the beginning and you gave us a shot and everything we have is, you know, because of that shot, because you believed in our talent. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to go a different way with it. And of course she was upset. We all cried. Um, 
we maintain that friendship. Just on a side note, she went on to manage a group called Third Story. You may have heard yeah, of. Yeah, I was working and, on that project. Yeah, and I actually arranged for them. I did a, a national anthem for them. Um, okay. Jackie had asked me if I could arrange something for them. Um, you know, even though they were supposed to be our competition, when I met them and they were like, they were so sweet and they were like, we want to be just like you guys. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's like all our yeah. fault that you guys are even signed. Like we had, you know, like they, just the fact that they wanted to follow in our footsteps, I had to help them out. You know, by so yeah, I by did some I, stuff with them. Yeah, by the time I came, it was the, the, the it was the, the second album and there were five of them and, and this was- Yeah, the, well, Gavin now is, is with uh, the Paul, Stan Paul Stanley Soul Station. Paul Stanley from KISS has got this like R&B act and he's got Gavin in there, Gavin Rome. He's, okay. he's the truth. Yeah, wow, shout yeah, out to Team yeah. Gavin. Yeah, I was, so, I was doing the push. Yeah, so, okay, so you-, you Oh, you this brings me to the, this is a really good, this is, this is great. This is for the fans right here. You may have heard an arrangement by yours truly on the group Viva Mas. Viva Mas is a group that I'm singing in now, an a cappella group. So you asked about the second album. I sat with Babyface at one point and said, hey, look. Well, he, well before I said, hey, look, he said, hey, listen. Now, he, he asked me if I could arrange another song like Hard to Say I'm Sorry. And he had suggested uh, After the Love is Gone by Earth, Wind and Fire, because, you know, it was David Foster again. And, you know, he's like, I know if you do like what you did with Hard to Say, then you, you know, just, I wasn't gonna tell him no. It wasn't a song I would have chosen because um, what I love about Earth, Wind and Fire is that their arrangements are instrumental. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, you know, I wouldn't have chosen it, but I'm gonna try it. So I did this After the Love is Gone, and it was nice, but to me, it was almost too spot on. Like too much, like, you know, when the horns go, ba, 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 it's the same thing as us going, ba, 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 ba. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever, right? But I did it. And then something told me like two days before, I said, you know what? The one that I really want to do is this Stevie Wonder Overjoyed. Now this is like 20 years ago. I did the arrangement again, but this time I had a digital recorder instead of a cassette recorder. And I multi-tracked it and I took it in and I sat with Babyface and I played it for him, this overjoyed a cappella arrangement. And he says, you know what? I like this one, let's do this one. So he, he's decided not to do After the Love is Gone and to do Overjoyed instead. Yeah. But then the second record never came out because of the label you know, doing its thing. And you know, there was no more LaFace. So then we got signed to DreamWorks and but this time we had Ladon in the group. Ladon replaced Mark Nelson. So I had Ladon sing the lead over and replace my lead with Ladon's lead because his voice was a lot, very Stevie esque. And by the way, Ladon just got his um, Master's of Arts from Columbia University. So shout out to Ladon Smith, Donald Smith. Um, so then we had that, that arrangement with my voice with Ladon's over it. It was just a demo for the group to learn. But then DreamWorks said, you know what? We own the rights to George Benson. So can you do Masquerade? And I'm like, I love Masquerade. That's my favorite song. Because I used to sing that live a lot, Masquerade by George Benson. So then we did that instead. And there's an acapella version of Masquerade that we recorded for the DreamWorks album that never came out. So then it sat, Overjoyed sat for like 20 years, man. And then when I got with Viva Mas, they hired me to do a song they wanted me to do a Christmas song, like an arrangement for a Christmas song. They're like, we love your arrangements. You know, can you do this an acapella for Christmas? And I'm like, okay, sure. Because I knew them from Philly and I saw some of the footage and they're like, they're really good. It was just four of them at the time, but they used to have five. So I'm like, okay. And then it was, oh man, you think you want to jump in on a verse or something? I was like, mm, okay, sure. Why not? Be a guest artist, whatever. Right. And we sounded so good together that I just, I couldn't sleep. And the next day I said, you guys want an extra member? They're like, get out of here. <laughs> I'm like, well, I really was kind of done with the whole group thing, but you guys remind me of what it's like when people actually love music and have work ethics and, you know, take care of their kids and their families and like, you know, like they're doing it for the right reasons. And that's how I got into the group. And then, and only then I said, I, what do you guys think about this overjoyed arrangement? They're like, we're doing it. We're doing it. <laughs> it was like it came back to life 20 years later that same arrangement that should have been on the edges second album is yeah. the same arrangement that is now currently uh on um uh, viva masa's uh upcoming album and it's out there on youtube it's getting close to 100,000 views already wow 
I think I think people would wonder that we you can tell us how you got onto Viva Mass, uh, where you are now, but a bit wondering why leave as yet because there there seemed to have been different people coming and going, but the group still continued as of today. How did your uh, sort of departure? Right. Now I'm going to tell you the truth of what I have never shared this publicly because no one's ever asked. And the thing is, right, back in 2014, I was engaged to my now ex-wife and she's Malaysian. And the group was, we had just finished, uh, we did a song for this, well, my ex-wife was an artist mm -hmm. and Man, I can't believe I'm, well, yeah, I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break it down. So one of the guys in the group, his wife was, his wife was Malaysia. And she had brought in this connection with a label in Malaysia to record a song with one of their artists for a movie soundtrack. And maybe you've seen it, it's Magical Moment. It's a song for like an animated kind of Pixar type of movie. It's got Sean Astin from Lord of the Rings and Steve Curry. And, you know, it's got some named people on it. And they, basically the owner of the label used to be in a, a popular singing group in Malaysia. And he found out that the uh, Dion's wife uh, owned this Malaysian restaurant that he was eating at. And they started talking. I was like, oh, your husband's in Asia. I love Asia. You know what? Um, I want to record. Uh, I would love, maybe they would want to be on the song, you know, with one of my artists. So basically a script of the movie was sent over and some tracks were shared. And again, I thought, let's all get together and shoot some ideas around and see what we can come up with. But instead, a couple of members decided to step off to the side, write and record and send stuff in without involving everyone else. Mm. And after a few failed attempts, the whole deal was about to fall apart. Then these same people came back and said, hey, man, you know what? I don't know. These guys ain't that serious, man. What do you think? You, you see what you can come up with. I wrote the thing in 10 minutes, the whole thing, 10 minutes. I don't know why. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm all that great, but when you're inspired, for whatever reason, yeah. I put the demo down, I, I, I read the script, and I was inspired. And I thought, wouldn't this be great to write some lyrics that had like a double meaning? Because the song was about like the princess and the frog, but it's a male frog that wants to kiss a female prince to become a real man. So I was like, hmm, you know, in that magical moment, when your lips kiss mine, you will finally know the truth. But, you know, that truth could be like anything. It doesn't have to be that you're going to turn into a frog. You know what I mean? So we got the, the gig. They sent the contracts over. And, you know, I was kind of like, mm, you know, let's go back and forth a little bit because we need to make sure this is right. They negotiated. We negotiated. We didn't have uh, a lawyer, but I was always the point person because we already had a writer, a standard kind of thing. You know, we've been in the game you know, long enough to know. Mm. So we sign the deal, we get out there. I fall in love like instantly with um, my now ex-wife, but we have two kids together, beautiful children. Mm. And, um, you know, that whole experience was kind of like, I felt like, hmm, it's a shame that like, you know, we couldn't have done this together all together. And like, they basically tried to cut me out of the situation. And then I wound up saving the situation. Um, then, I wound up marrying this woman and moving to Malaysia. Oh. Now, before I left, before I left, I never said, you know what? I'm leaving the group. We weren't doing much. We only got calls once or twice a year, maybe four times in a year to do like some old school R&B thing. Or, and, you know, this is 2014, 2015. There was such thing as remote recording and like, it's a 19 hour flight, but like, if you're gonna pay us, you know, $30,000 a gig or whatever, you don't think I'll fly out? I mean, it's not that expensive. I'll pay for my own flight. What do you do? I flew back and forth a lot. So um, what happened? This is the point when I left. And 
this is crazy to me, but this is what happened. Um, Mark Nelson came back to offer a deal to uh, the group that he had brought in. He masterminded this deal um, with a label who didn't necessarily have experience in R&B, but you know, they were kind of a catalog label and they had a few interesting artists. They offered us to re-record uh, last night um, without Babyface uh, and basically do an album. But the numbers, the way that the deal was structured, we would wind up owing the label money mm. if we didn't come in under budget. And I'm like, that doesn't sound right to me. So they're gonna give us not even, we'll say a month's rent up front for a year's worth of work. And then we owe them money and that's <laughs> the first draft. So I said, you know what? Um, I can't, we're better than this. Not I'm better, we're better than this. But, you know, a few of the other guys were like, you know what, um, we don't have anything else going on. I said, speak for yourself. I can't, I can't do it. But call me whenever, you know, like I'll do anything else. Or if, if there's any shows coming up or whatever, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. You know, I didn't think that I was leaving the group. I just refused to sign that deal. And if they wanted to sign, I couldn't physically stop them from signing it because no one person owned the rights. We, as a collective, owned the trademark to the name. Okay. So then I come to find out that the group re-registered the trademark without my name on it. When I started it from the beginning with the group from 89 till now, when the original trademark was registered, it was me, Dion, Kenny, uh, well, Claude wasn't in the group at the time, but make a long story short, other names have come and gone, but every version of the trademark had my name. So how would it look if Mark Zuckerberg came back to a group as an, I'm sorry, came back to Facebook as an employee? Like they just take you off the board, but you can come get a salary. I'm not gonna be an employee of a company that I started, but that was the, the if there were ever to be a reunion, that would be uh, the deal breaker for me. I was like, wait, so I had to find out after the fact that they had taken my name off and didn't tell me that I wasn't even on a trademark. And then the royalties that were coming in through Sound Exchange uh, wound up going to them. They took my name off. I had to go back to Sound Exchange and send them a copy of the album saying, look, my name is still on the album. Just because they have the rights to as yet doesn't mean they have the rights to Sean Rivera's performance royalties in the group. That's two separate things. And Santa's Change agreed with me and withheld their royalties uh, until I was paid back. Wow. So there's the truth. So is it because you just elected not to uh, sign the contract that they thought, you know, you're going to be a stumbling block? Or is it because you moved to Malaysia? What, what do you think ultimately? You know what? The I think it was a, a series of things. Maybe they just didn't like me. I don't know. I can't speak for them. And all I know is that I tried my best to do what was best for everyone. Now, I'm not perfect. I may have said something sarcastically to hurt their feelings, or maybe, you know, maybe they just don't, they just don't like being told the truth. All I know is for everyone watching this, right? Go out and watch the Kleptomaniac video. It'll tell you everything you need to know. You watch the Kleptomaniac video. And then afterwards, you know, it'd be nice to watch Viva Mas Overjoyed. Just watch them back to back. And you can tell that we've decided to go in different directions. And that's where it is. Hmm. So now that you've, um, you guys have sort of parted ways and you're, you're with, with Viva Mas, before we, we, we you know, uh, what's the plan for the group? Um, because you, if, I mean, we'll look at Overjoyed and other things, but do you have plans to, you said you finished an album? Yes, story, yes. Uh, um, we've recorded uh, for the last couple of years, uh, we've recorded uh, a lot of wonderful songs. Um, we've only released a couple of singles just to kind of give people an idea of what we're up to. Yeah. Um, but basically we plan to finish an album and release it 
Um, we're independent at this point. We're not necessarily thirsty for a major label record deal. However, um, you know, there is a such thing as an offer we can't refuse. But at this time, the group invests our resources. We each put up what we can to make things happen. Um, and shout out to Eddie Craze Garcia, because he's the one in the group who's been like the lead investor and he brought me in. Um, basically, he would not stop until we sat down and talked about working together. Um, and everyone in Viva Mas, uh, like you're talking about playing roles, yeah. everyone in the, the difference between the as yet situation and this situation is that Viva Mas has been together almost as long as as yet. Oh. Um, and they've done a lot of things like they've sang, you know, for the Pope. Um, they've opened for Pitbull. Like, you know, they've done a lot of wonderful things here. They're known and respected here in the city. Uh, and they have members who've also been in other popular groups here in America. But the difference is we're doing this for the love of music, making quality music. We produce our own records. We choose when someone else sends us a song, whether we write it or they write it, we go into the studio with our own money and we sit down and we don't leave until it's right. We mix it and master it with the best people we can find right here in Philadelphia. Cambridge Sounds is one of the Cambridge Sound Studios, which also, um, you know, is home to some of the greatest Philly legends like uh, Kathy Sledge, uh, you know, uh, Levert, the OJs, True. Um, they're not from Philly, but still a lot of great uh, artists have recorded at the studio. Um, and then hopefully people will see what we do on our own and see that all they have to do is co-sign and maybe, you know, invest in it to take uh, the promotion to the next level. Yeah. And we can do what I set out to do when I got into music, which was to follow my heart, make something I believe in. Yeah. And I'm not against sharing with anyone, whether it be creatively co-writing or breaking bread, but there's different types of artists. Like, you know, when boy bands are put together by, you know, those guys, those Bengalis who put together these groups. Yeah. Then you just show up and sing like the K-pop bands where you're just a vehicle. But when you have something to say musically and you have, you're driven by your love for it, it's a, just a whole nother energy, man. We're brothers. We are yeah. brothers. Um, we all happen to be Puerto Rican, but you know, like no two of us are alike anyway. So well, yeah, I, mean, I was that's gonna ask that because you came from, you know, um, you know, when I first saw Asiat and, and the video and I saw you, I thought you were um, no different from Dion, just light, light skin, um, black, because, you know, Americans. Uh, oh, oh, you know what, let, let, me, let me break this down for you. This, this is a perfect opportunity to educate those viewers who, especially in the UK, because there are very few Puerto Ricans in the UK. Yeah. Our heritage as Puerto Ricans on the island is African. Taino and Spaniard. So technically, we are light skinned black, some of us, most of us, many of us. However, culturally, there are those who only speak Spanish, those who are anglicized, and everything in between. So there's a diaspora within a diaspora mm -hmm. of Afro Caribbeans. If you see me with long hair, I've had a big old Afro. Okay. So my thing is, I do understand the differences and the nuances between being a Puerto Rican um, of African descent as well as, and yes, there are those who are more Afro than me and more Anglo than me. Mm -hmm. However, I embrace all of it and I choose to accept all of it. And, you know, I was proud to be on the cover of Black Beat Magazine. I was proud to sing in gospel choir, proud to be on the Apollo, proud of all of it. Like, it's not about trying to be something or pretending to be or denying anything. Yeah. Did, was it ever, did you have, when you were in as yet, was there any pushback saying, oh, you're not, a, you're not one of the, you know, you were in You know what, I, I never, okay. I never got it to be fair, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe jokingly sometimes I might have gotten a few jokes here and there, but nothing worse than, you know, I never got the sense from inside the group that anyone was specifically discriminating against me. I mean, I get the jokes, you know, but my life culturally from day one has always been from a perspective of 
seeing things through the window of what it is like to be um, a person of color in America, yeah. a black American, uh, a Latino. And I understand, I'm not, I'd be stupid to say, hey, it's obvious that I have some, you know, Spaniard, some European features, but yeah. the concept of whiteness is this illusion that basically uh, is perpetuated here in the United States and I'm not fooled by any of it. Yeah. This would lead us to a point where you, you, you got to do some work with Maya Angelou, um, legendary poet uh, and li literary giant. How did that come about? So I used to, hmm. I used to listen to her, like she used to have commercials for the United Negro College Fund and like in, in school, we, it's kind of like required reading, like a lot of poetry recitals, somebody would perform Phenomenal Woman or Still I Rise. So I kind of, I knew of her peripherally, but then I was kind of in a funk after the As Yet thing kind of died down. We weren't doing, we weren't making enough to even sustain ourselves without taking on day jobs, which is, it's tough. This is why a lot of artists fall because there's, they've gotten so used to being that you can't just go take a job, you know, at the Foot Locker after you've been a celebrity. So I took a job at a movie studio out in the middle of nowhere, you know, like a, a B movie studio, I'll say. And I was feeling kind of depressed and I was in a storage room and I had played one of uh, at this audio cassette of Maya Angelou reading uh, Brave and Startling Truth and it like made me cry, just like something about the, the, the way she was saying things. Mm. And I'm like, wow, like that's really moving. I wanna know more about, uh, let me just dig into her a little more because yeah. something about her is so compelling. So then when I read her autobiography, I snapped out of my funk. I was like, hold on a minute. I have no right to complain about anything <laughs> in life because she's, she has suffered more than I ever will so that I won't have to. Yeah. And I just had this thing. I was like, if there's a way that I can get this feeling that she's giving me into my music and share it with others from another generation, because I just like I had, you know, I, at the time, you know, I had my daughter. Uh, she was probably about eight, um, and I thought, you know, she needs this for her. And the, how I got to work with Maya was, I basically. After, after I'd heard her music and her poetry, right, I had, the idea was in my head. Then I got hired to do a blues festival in Italy. And while I was in Italy, a, the, the key, one of my friends who was a keyboard player, uh, Alex Alessandroni, he was a music director for Pink and for Christina Aguilera, for Bobby Brown, for James wow. Brown, I mean, not James Brown, but Rick James, you name it. This guy was like, he's still one of the most awesome music MDs ever, Natalie Cole's MD. He said, um, he said my mother-in-law is out in Italy you know, his father at the time was the late, great Alison Joni. You know, you know the, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly? That yeah, yeah, yeah. The whistler? I can't whistle, but the yeah. whistler. So that was his dad. So I went to go visit them in Italy in between my touring. And I'm in the living room, and I see this picture of Margaret Courtney Clark standing with Dr. Maya Angelou. And I said, oh, that's great. You got to meet Dr. Angelou? She said, I wrote four books with Dr. Angelou. And I said, you know, I always wanted to make music, uh, set her poetry to music. And she looked at me and said, do it like that. And I was like, uh -oh, now I got to do it because she didn't promise me anything. But I knew that if she said do it and I did it, there was just a slight chance that I might be able to get it to Dr. Angelo. Make a long story short, um, I went back in the studio and I printed out her poetry just some the, from the collected poems. And I used to do poetry and uh, spoken word at uh, Fifth Street Dicks, uh, Lamert Park in Philly. It's like this, I mean, Philly, Lamert Park in Los Angeles um, that has this big spoken word scene. So when I was, one of my shticks was to print out poetry and throw it on the floor and just pick out whichever um, poem and just recite it. That way it kept it fresh and unexpected. So. I threw some poems on the floor, I picked one up, and Still I Rise was one of them. And I had Simone Cello sitting with his guitar, and I just started singing wow. the poetry. Mm -hmm. And he started playing, and we started recording, and it started happening. And then I didn't have any 
money like that. I mean, like real money to pay all these guys. But they were such big fans of Maya Angelou that everybody recorded for free. And then wow. a good friend of mine named Troy Hinton, uh, he was uh, working at the studio too. He said, hey, you should play this, you know, for my peoples, my mother and, you know, his friend, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Smooch Music. The label, his, he, he was, well, still is, the daughter of the CEO of Smooch Music, the son of, I'm getting this all backwards, the son of the president of the label. I didn't know that his mom had a label. <laughs> all I knew was, sure, you want somebody who's going to invest in this thing because maybe I can pay the lawyers or something to try to get this thing happening. So it took seven years seven. from the time that project started to get it into the hands of Maya Angelou. And next thing you know, we're sitting in her living room uh, and she's singing and performing to us. And uh, I actually got a chance to, um, to work with her before she passed. It was her last wow. musical project before she passed away. God rest her soul, My goodness. Dr. Angelou. So the album is called Cage Bird Songs. And I took her poetry um, from audiobooks, from live performances and pre-recorded performances and lined it up with live music in such a way that it sounds like she went in the studio and recorded it herself. My goodness. I mean, that's, that's you know, not many people have, have had to, had a chance to see it, but to, to actually work with her in, in that way. And the fact that it came by you being <laughs> bold and, and stepping forward and stuff. You know, what, what's really been um, fascinating is the fact that, um, you know, we started off with a picture of a challenging upbringing, um, but then how music and school, in a way, um, gave you a vision, despite your limited vision um, of your background. When you, when you talk about the, the sound and, and the sight, I remember one of my favorite Marvel characters was Daredevil, yeah, see, but he could see clip better than everyone else because of his hearing and the sonic and stuff. But it was he was able to see much clearly than the person who couldn't see, just because of um, being sensitive to things around. So as you were saying, sharing your story, I was just saying, oh, that's like that kind of thing. Um, but also, you know, it's I, I guess it was it's very quite disappointing hearing and it's not I, I don't think from my viewers it'll be surprising to hear the sort of tales behind the scenes of the label uh, with the group within the group um, because we've heard so many in such you know sad stories sometimes it's about someone taking all the publishing and manager taking all the money in fighting within 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 the group and stuff um, but you guys also unfortunately it was by the time you were ready for your second and third album, there was a shift in the industry where R&B yeah. was being drowned out for hip hop uh, for some for some very strange reason. I still love the group. I don't want to. I don't want anyone to think that like I'm bitter or something. It's just you know I never spoke out on it until I saw that they literally uh, took credit for my work, and that really it hurt my heart because I still consider them brothers. Um, but the truth is the truth. And as far as the industry shifting, that's to be expected. And one of the most frustrating things about that first album was that we come as a group, we came from the inner city, the hip hop was part of our lives. I used to break dance with, with my windbreaker and doing hand spins. And like, we, we used to rap and sing together in dimension and sound. Like even Claude Thomas, little shy Claude Thomas used to rap. You know what I'm saying? But they wouldn't put that on our record because we were competing with boys to men. When I said we wanted to go in another direction, we wanted to be who we were to reflect all of that. And this is, but this is before Lauren Hill, before a lot of artists were mixing. Now all the rappers want to sing and all the singers want to rap. But back then it was like, no, singer sing. And then you bring in a guest artist for the yeah. hot 16. You know, like the formula didn't allow for that. And we were ahead of our time. But yeah. when you're ahead of your time, you're supposed to stick to your guns until they catch up. You don't just give up and, and yeah. get along, you know, go along to get along. Yeah, no, you're right. But then also the, 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 the size within the uh, within the industry where you think you're getting all these free things, you think all this promotional stuff, labels really try and not realizing that it's almost like taking your credit card and charging and yeah. eventually at the end of the month you're going to have to pay it back. Um, I mean, when can we look forward to seeing the stuff from uh, your, your, your new group? Because as I said, it's... Um, and I, what, what I'll do is after this, check here 
hopefully try and point people to uh, the video of, you said, Overjoyed. Yes, well, we have two singles currently as the Viva Mas, V-I-V-A space M-A-S. Viva Mas on YouTube has so many songs even before I joined. They even covered Boys to Men in Spanish uh, before I joined. But the two newest singles are Lost in You, which is a remake of the Chris Gaines, uh, Garth Brooks song, and Overjoyed Acapella. So if you type in Overjoyed Viva Mas, you'll find that those are our two most current singles, Lost in You and Overjoyed. Also, there's vivamasmusic.com, which has uh, the bios and the pictures, and we're actually um, you know, in the process of adding. We just did a new photo shoot. Um, mm -hmm. And also with the Maya Angelou Project, you can find it on cagebirdsongs.com. There's all sorts of wonderful, that album has been out, but there's a couple of new remixes that have just been done for 2021. Given uh, the social justice uh, awareness that has come about, we revisited the music and have a new video for Still I Rise. And also Oprah Winfrey's network uh, co-produced a video for Harlem Hopscotch that features Zendaya wow. and Alfonso Ribeiro um, and Mia Peoples and a bunch of other uh, America's Best Dance Crew. Wow. So you can find it all online. You know, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating because it's, um... Unlike before, when you know you're behind a label and there's lots of promotion and out there, but this era has changed where uh, things are being streamed. You play it on YouTube and it collects its analytics and stuff like that. Do you guys plan to release your stuff digitally, or do you plan to actually put stuff on vinyl and expect people to buy? Well, I think we're going to do a little of everything, even NFTs. Are you hip to those? We're, yeah, we're probably going to yeah. do all of it. Um, but right now, we do have um, our music. Well, with Viva Massive Music, it's on digital platforms. I have a few solo things that are out there, too. But, you know, like Spotify and, and uh, iTunes Music, Apple Music and all that. Um, yeah. It's out there. But also, you can buy physical copies of, of some of our music on uh, Amazon. Uh, they have, like, they still do CDs with artwork and everything. Uh, especially the, the deluxe edition of Cage Bird Songs. It has all this artwork that was done by uh, Alan Aldridge, who did the Hard Rock Cafe logo, the House of Blues logo, Captain Fantastic uh, album for uh, Elton John, you name it. This guy has done this Beatles uh, album covers. So you can get all this fantastic artwork, physical things you can hold in your hand. Viva Mas, we're going to finish the album and release it on as many formats as possible. And should we choose to sign with a label, uh, we will you know, negotiate how to release uh, in this new paradigm and see what happens. Are you, are you just finally, the joy of music come back? You know, the I'm sorry for putting you to sleep with all my boring stories, man. No, no, no. Has the joy of the music come back? after all these years of the industry and stuff has has it you know what i really did for a while especially after the divorce and you know i took some time to really regather myself and i didn't i really did at one point consider not making music um as a living for a living wow but um i've reached a point now where I, I, I believe in myself enough to know that whatever I set my mind to, um, I can do for a living. It doesn't have to be for a lifetime. Um, I'm good at other things, and that's great. However, music keeps calling me, and I've realized now, thanks to Viva Mas, uh, for, they've given me an excuse to love music again. Uh, and not just acapella harmonies, and not just R&B, but just the creative process of you know, bringing something within. Birds fly because they're born with wings and there's no need to even try. You know, sometimes you just got to push yourself off that ledge yeah. and, and keep on flapping. So, yeah. and my kids, they inspire me the most, like just to see the pride on their faces and, you know, to know that what will be left to share with them um, is what their daddy left behind. And some yeah. people have statues named after them and, you know, it just make me easy. Yeah, just make me easy. The I mean, people, so with the, uh, the the current four members of the group, Mark and some of the other old members. Mark's not in the group right now. No, no, no. I was saying, so you've got the current four members. You've got people who Mark oh, okay. who's left. You've got others who have also come and gone. What's your relationship with them just on a personal, because these are people you've known since you were kids. Oh, well, yeah, I a long time. I spoke to Mark recently. Um, I, I mentioned Mark first because uh, I spoke to him recently. 
And um, we talked about the possibility of working together again at some point creatively. We've actually vibed better creatively than we have personally. And he knows that too. Um, Dashan Benson, I'm working on some music with him. Uh, you know, again, he's, he's someone I've known from the very, very, very beginning. And even though he's no longer in as yet, uh, we still talk. And as a matter of fact, when he came here to Philadelphia, we, we broke bread and, uh, and I met his lovely wife and his son and, and they're great people. Um, I have not spoken personally to the current members that are in Vegas. I have not spoken to Dion, Claude, Kenny, or Paris, who I haven't met yet, a uh, very talented guy who, uh, I guess he would say he took my place in the sense of uh, when I left, he's the next guy that came in. Um, and he used to work with uh, Teddy Riley. Well, you, you interviewed him, so you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, my thing is, I don't want to disappoint the fans if they ask, is there you know, a chance you'll ever get back together? I'll say there's always a possibility, but not a probability. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we've watched the Temptations do this for such a long time that, uh, <laughs> that um, yeah, and, um, and yeah, back and forth. So, but no, I, I think it's more so the, even if, you know, you've separated, but it's the how, if, you, if it's to a point where you can still communicate, if you saw them in, a, in if you, show them in a, or at a show would you guys just walk past each other with like hey what's up guys long time to see you know what i've talked about this possibility uh, with my group and viva mas uh we agreed that if the opportunity ever arose we would open for them we'd open for asia in a heartbeat because asia is the bigger name right now yeah and they're talented so why not open up for asia it's only fair yeah. I mean, but is that probable? It's possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I always ask on my guests before they leave, that if you were stuck in an elevator and they said, look, you know, it'll take us a couple of hours to get you out, but in the meantime, we can put a movie on for you. What movie would you request to watch? Ooh. Wait, I'm not going to die in the elevator, right? No, 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 no. It's, it's more like if you just... If you, it's just killing time, they put you on and say, look, we, we can put a movie out for you. This is going to sound weird, right? But I want to watch a movie I've never seen before, because if I saw it before, it's going to drag on. But like, if I'm trying to kill two hours, it has to be something I've never seen. It has to be something new. So the answer to the question is, whatever the newest, hottest movie is that I haven't seen yet, that'd be a perfect time to watch it. I've got time to kill it, nowhere else to go. In some cases, the, the question is really geared towards if what's one of your favorite movies that you like. If I'm stuck, I'd always have to, I can bring this out and I'll get entertained. All right, all right. Yeah, In that so case, the, the first one that comes to mind, I don't have a favorite, but I would love to watch the um, West Side Story, the, the movie version of West Side Story. Okay. Are you hip to that? It's I, I, I watched, but, uh, yeah, I watched the old old version, version as a kid. They used to show it quite a lot. And, be, yeah. yeah, only because it would bring me to a nostalgic time. It would cheer me up. I can dance along. And when you're a jet, you're a jet all the way from the first day you joined to your last dying day. I mean, how could you be panicking uh, in an elevator while you're snapping <laughs> your fingers? And, boy, boy, crazy boy. Do -do -do. Maria, I just met a girl named Maria. <laughs> Well, that's, maybe tomorrow I'll have a different answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> what about a song, though? Because they say, okay, we're about to put in a movie, but we play a song before the movie comes on. What, what track would you request? You know what? Wow. <laughs> you know what? Okay. I would take Layla Hathaway, When Your Life Was Low. Because okay. that always takes me back to a place of being that unsigned, unbelieved in, humble person who thought he could change the world, who naively believed that everything was probable. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know that song, uh, When Your Life no. Was Low? By no, 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 no. Hathaway. It's no, a great no. song. It was uh, Joe Sample and, and Layla Hathaway. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, but most importantly, to press the notification bell so that you can be notified when we do have a new interview, loads to come. But thanks a lot for watching.